Welcome to the Fly Culture Podcast, bringing you interviews, reviews, and fishing tips. Here's your host, Pete Tigus. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Fly Culture Podcast. We're getting towards the end of September. The season feels as though it's slipping away. The rain is heavy now in Devon. It may be salmon I go and chase for the last few days. There may be the chance of a trout. I doubt there'll be a rising one, but we'll give it a go anyway. But for the podcast today, there's a question I'm often asked um, by podcast guests. I ask them all the time, where would their dream fishing destination be? Near the very top is hardly surprisingly Montana. I thought it would be interesting to get an insider's view from someone who lives there and guides on the rivers of the state. And I'm thrilled to introduce my friend Eric Strader to the podcast. Verd, it's great to have you along on the podcast. How are you doing, my friend? I'm doing good. The weather's uh, turning into fall out here in Montana and it's getting a little colder and the betas are starting to come off on the Yellowstone. That still sounds pretty good. And I know I've been out in October time in Montana previously, and I noticed that the temperature when it turns, it goes very, very quickly, doesn't it? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Just a few days I was in flip flops and now I'm in uh, my waders and a heavy jacket. (laughs) But does that mean you say the betis are hatching still? Does that mean you've still got some dry fly action ahead of you? Absolutely. You know, some of the, some of the better dry fly fishing can be found in the fall out here. Um, after Labor Day, uh, the traffic on, especially the Yellowstone River kind of dies down. Um, the fish get a little bit of a break. Um, not so many recreational floaters on the river. And, uh, as soon as we get a little bit of cloud cover, uh, the blue wing olives, uh, really start to pop and the fish will key in on them. Um, and it's, it can be some, some really incredible sight, sight fishing. Um, anchoring up on the Yellowstone and, and fishing some softer water to some really beautiful trout. Does that mean you get a little bit of a chance to fish? Exactly. Um, and that's the greatest part of the season. I usually, uh, I try to leave myself a little bit of a gap in between my fishing and hunting season um, in order for myself to get out on the river, um, enjoy a little bit more of what I do uh, and be a little bit more hands-on myself. Um and get to put a few of those fish in the net. So it's uh, it's an excellent time of year. It's a time of year that I always look forward to, uh, but it's also bittersweet. You know, I kind of hang up my fishing hat and, and put the hunting, hunting boots on. So um, it's a, it's a, it's a great time of year, but it's also a, a sign that I've got to wait a few more months to get clients back in my boat. <laughs> and I always remember very fondly that when I took a group down to Montana and you helped look after us, that, you would do a hard day on the drift boat or uh, wading as well. And then I always remember you organizing a fishing trip for when you got off as well. So we finished and then you'd hit the water. Are you still doing that as hard as you used to? Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, I still, uh, I still have a group um, of buddies of mine that come out after my fishing season. I actually just picked up a friend uh, from the airport um, and uh for us, you know, I'm still a streamer nut. Uh, I still love throwing streamers. And, uh, you know, the fall is kind of a sure sign of that. When the weather starts to get cool, um, it's time to bring out the, the seven and eight weights and the big long streamers and, and the sinking line. Sounds absolutely perfect to me. So we've talked about Montana, but can you give us an idea of where you're based? Where do you, where do you live? So I'm based out of Livingston, Montana which is, you know, Bozeman's kind of the hot hub right now. And we're located 35 minutes east of Bozeman in Livingston, Montana, which is 50 miles north of Yellowstone National Park. And we're kind of, our home base is the Yellowstone River and Yellowstone National Park. Uh, The Yellowstone River lends itself to spring, summer, and fall fishing. Um, It's open year round if you can stand the, the, the cold in the winter. Um, but it, it typically will open and we'll really start fishing after runoff, uh, towards the end of June, early July and fish it through October. And you mentioned those rivers in the park as well, which again, I've been lucky enough to experience with your good self. And um, what do you have a preference if you've got a day off, will it be throwing meat on the Yellowstone or will you head out into one of these little streams in the park somewhere? Uh, when, well, I will say when I 
when I first kind of dipped my toes into the guiding industry and uh, and really started to guide out here, I was a I was a streamer junkie through and through. Um, now I feel like as I've evolved as a fisherman and as a guide, um, I really try to lean more towards smaller creeks and really keying in um, on catching one single fish with the fly that they're eating, matching the hatch, setting down, watching a fish rise um, and fishing to that fish. And I think I picked uh, a little bit of that up from you whenever you came out and, and fished with us. That was probably some of the most memorable uh, dry fly experiences that I've had. Um, and some of the most educational times I've had is watching you uh, fish and pick out, pick out fish and, uh, and fish to them and, and catch them. Um, and that's, that's more what I will lean towards nowadays um, is to find some, some picky trout and to really, uh, really challenge myself um, and not just go in there with a big streamer and rip it around and see what eats it. Do you think that's an age thing then? Do you think it is now that you've got a, quite a few years under your belt now that you just like to savor every moment of it rather than getting those short times to fish and try and catch something quickly is, do you think that's part of it? Yeah, I think uh, it's a natural progression and an evolution as a, you know, as a, as a fly fisherman or woman um, to kind of go through the stages of, you know, learning how to cast and just getting a fly in the water and then wanting to catch a bunch of fish and then wanting to catch a, a big fish. And now, not necessarily wanting to catch a big fish, but to catch a picky fish and, and, and to fool a smart trout, um, over catching big ones or a lot of fish. Um, I think that's kind of a natural progression, um, or at least it has been for me for sure. And I, before we, I just wanted to circle round on something that you said about Livingstone where you live. And I know that you're a creative person. You're a highly skilled photographer. You've got Derek DeYoung and, and A.D. A. D. Maddox in Livingstone as well. Is it a creative area? I've, I've been there very briefly, but is, is it a hub for creative people? It, it sure is. Uh, not only um, photographers and, and famed fly fishermen, um, but also writers, movie stars. Um, and, and, you know, every, uh, the one thing that everybody tends to have in common is fly fishing. Uh, which is which is pretty cool to see all these creatives uh, around town and uh, everybody's minds going in a bunch of different directions and everybody's got their priorities. But at the end of the day, everybody wants to just get out on the river and fish. <laughs> yeah, that sounds perfect. And it's an interesting time, I guess, for Montana as well, given the uh, Kevin Costner's TV program, Yellowstone, which I've been addicted to i have to say mainly because i'm trying to work out if if i spot livingstone because it sometimes looks like livingstone in some of the shots like I, I, am i right or wrong yeah yeah abs absolutely so it's been uh it's been an interesting ride um when the when the show first came out i believe they were shooting it uh, in maybe oregon and utah uh, a few other places uh, now they actually have a film ranch um, in Paradise Valley that they've filmed. I don't know necessarily that show, but quite a few Westerns. Um, I was actually working for a hunting outfitter and they filmed the show 1872, I believe it was, was the, the prequel to Yellowstone. Um, they shot on one of the ranches that I guide on for hunting. Um, when they go through the plains and all that kind of stuff of eastern Montana, that's where they that's kind of where they filmed it. Um, very neat to see some of the, uh, the movie stars around town. Um, a lot of times you don't necessarily recognize them, which is pretty cool. Um, a lot of them are a lot shorter and smaller than they look on TV. Um, but, uh, yeah, and it's, it's, it's certainly been, um, started a boom almost, uh, you know, kind of relate it to some of these old timers that have talked about a river runs through it when they filmed it here in Livingston and how the, the fly fishing culture kind of really had a boom in the, in the early and mid nineties. Um, we're kind of seeing the same thing, uh, which has been excellent. You know, the more, the more people that we can get into this sport, the more it's going to grow. And, and ultimately, um, in my mind that that represents more and more conservation that we can put towards, you know, helping protect, uh, especially these native Yellowstone cutthroat that we have out here and just all of our water in general. Lovely answer. And does that mean that there is more traffic on the river as a result of that? Or have you noticed it's got 
busier very, very quickly, plus lockdown absolutely. as well, I guess. Yeah. Absolutely. So, so, so you touched on that just a little bit between, between the show Yellowstone and the traffic, people want to come out and see this beautiful area that we live in and COVID wanting to get out of the house, being able to work remotely. We've really seen, you know, a pretty, a pretty large boom, um, in the fishing industry and, um, you know, quite a bit of traffic on a lot of these rivers. Um, but with that being said, you know, there's so many different places to fish. Um, there, there's going to be, you know, your top five, you know, rivers out here that are, you know, frequent in a lot and, uh, have, have more traffic than others. Um, but it doesn't seem that the fish have really minded most of that. Um, it's put an impact on, a, on, a, on a few fisheries. Um, uh, but I would say, you know, it's, it's, it's not necessarily the fishermen. It's more of the fact of our weather and, uh, I believe that it's more weather, weather dependent as far as the snow and the drought um, and that kind of stuff. As far as the fishing pressure goes, um, I think the fish are more affected by that than, you know, the sports that we have uh, practicing good fish handling techniques, stuff like that. But there certainly are more and more people um, out on the river in the last three years than, than we have had in the past. And putting into context, I was going to come back around to the Yellowstone for listeners in the, particularly in the UK. What is the Yellowstone carrying fish per mile at the moment? Uh, the Yellowstone, as far as I know, we're right around thirty five hundred fish per mile, um, and and those that data is collected in the springtime. Um, there's been some talk on some of these other rivers on on how that data has been collected and how how true the numbers are to the Yellowstone or some of the other rivers. Um, I think that they do, you know, a, a fairly good job of being consistent on trying to collect that data. Uh, there's a few rivers where it might be a little tougher for them to get more accurate data than, um, say the Yellowstone. Um, but the Yellowstone seems to be in pretty good shape. Um, you know, last year we had a, a, a 500 year flood, which, which had a huge impact, uh, on the fish, on the bugs, um, the river structure itself. Um, and I really feel, uh, like, you know, this year post flood, the fish have really recovered very, very well, as well as the bugs. Um, the bug life seemed to bounce back pretty well. And I think, you know, it, it was really hard to deal with the flood last year. Um, had a lot of cancellations. Uh, the fish weren't quite sure what was going on. Neither were we. Um, but I think it's probably long-term one of the best things that could have happened to the river. It had a major clean out. And I think in the next five years, the Yellowstone's probably going to be the river to fish in Montana. Wow. That sounds pretty cool. And it is one of those sort of legendary rivers that so many people have heard about. And I remember the shots with that flood. There was a, a, a shot of a bridge going, wasn't it? Um, yeah. Yeah. Was that garden away or around that? That was, yeah. So, uh, the, one of the lodges that I worked for Hubbard Yellowstone Lodge, which is the lodge where, where I met you, um, that was the bridge to go up to that lodge. Wow. Um, I got a call at six 30 in the morning and somebody said, Hey, the bridge just went in the river. Um, I had no idea what they were talking about. I couldn't even imagine that giant steel bridge getting swept away. Um, uh, and they sent me the video and I just was, I was flabbergasted. Um, I couldn't believe it. And then once the river went down, it, it kind of, it was pretty funny as, as much, uh, force as it took to kind of blow that bridge out, it was so heavy and so, so much steel that it just literally just sank right there below where it, where it went in. There was a lot of speculation of, oh, it went downstream and everybody was looking for parts and pieces of it, but it literally just came off of the, the side, just went straight down. Um, <laughs> which they, they actually cleaned up 100%. It's no longer in the river, um, which is great. And the plan to have a new bridge by, I believe, next spring um, before July, um, they should have a new bridge in there, which is great. <laughs> great. Wow. I didn't realize it was that actual bridge, so I kind of know that one. Yeah. So it's lovely to, to hear that. And 
you know, we were talking about the business of the rivers and you talked about the lodge there. And that that got me thinking about, you know, when I first fished the States many, many years ago, I assumed wrongly we didn't have internet, we didn't have anything else, that it would be like some of these um, salmon run shots you see combat fishing. But it's anything but that. And there's so many streams, isn't it? I was thinking of the one that ran through the bottom of Hubbard's that I enjoyed fishing just as much and there's all these streams there's so much water isn't there that's you're not gonna have to worry about even in the park bumping into loads of people is there? there's always somewhere that you could go fish absolutely and that's the beauty of where we live um you know it's it's great to fish you know i i call kind of like the big five um you know you have your your major rivers that that everybody has heard about you know the yellowstone the big hole the madison um Rock Creek, the Jefferson, you know, some of those big rivers, um, the Clark Fork, all that kind of stuff that are, they do have heavy traffic, but there's so many different tributaries that feed into those rivers. Um, there's so many miles of, of almost untouched fishable water that if you just put on a pair of hiking boots and, and get off the beaten path or, you know, get out of the drift boat and go for a little hike, you're not going to see anybody. Um, and it's even a matter on, on some of those bigger rivers too, just time of day of fishing. Um, I've kind of started to tailor my business to where I'm taking guests out either really, really early or start in the evening, uh, or later in the day and, and fish until dark and just kind of avoid a lot of the, the, the major crowds. Um, it's, it's super easy to do that. Um, and especially in Yellowstone national park, uh, 90% of the visitors to Yellowstone get less than 25 feet off of the road. Um, just a matter of putting your boots on and taking a little hike and you won't see anybody. Um, and that's, and that, that, that rings true for the entire state. Um, there's so many, so many tributaries, to these major rivers that, that don't get fished. Um, and that makes it a really special kind of, kind of a place where, where you see, you see pictures of loaded, loaded streams with fishermen elbow to elbow. And it's, it, it's certainly, can seem like that some days in the drift boat on the Madison, um, but you get out a little ways and fish some of those different places or, or go out later in the day. And a lot of times you won't see anybody. And so for you, where would be your favorite place? Where do you like to go fish? You said, obviously you like to fish these um, smaller streams. I guess I'm in danger of you hotspotting, although I guess it's not going to happen here, but would it be a, around the Livingstone area? Because I know we were talking off mic and you said you're guiding throughout the state now. So does that mean that you've got places that little sort of hidey holes that you like going to fish every now and again? Absolutely. Um, my, uh, in recent years, I've kind of fallen in love with, uh, the Beaverhead river, which is in Dillon, Montana. And, uh, when I first saw it, I, you know, I really didn't think much of it. It's really small. It's very unassuming. Um, a lot of it runs near, um, a highway. Um, so kind of get a lot of road traffic and noise. Um, but, uh, with that being said, it's kind of, uh, a hidden gem that's kind of right out in plain sight. Um, I've, I, I fished it, uh, during the day with sports and seen, uh, some really incredible hatches and dropped them off at the fly shop and went right back out, got in my boat and, and had some of the best dry fly fishing I've ever had in my life, um, in the evenings on, on the Beaverhead river. And there's tributaries that run into that, that, um, if you know where the Beaverhead River is, it's not hard to figure out where those places are. And and that's been in the last few years, probably my most favorite river or creek uh, to fish in the state. I've just had some of the most amazing moments um, on that river. And, and the amount of fish that I get to watch eat natural flies is just incredible. Yeah, that does sound very, very good. And um, from a hatch point of view, we've touched on the Blue Wings back end of the season now the rivers i guess are hatch driven and are you looking for sort of particular hatches what are what are the highlight hatches of the season that your the trout really get locked into well you know as you know just in general um you know what we're looking forward to you know to kind of kick off the season is the salmon flies 
Um, the salmon flies and the goldens will start to kick. Um, you get your caddis on the back end of that and maybe a little bit on the front end. Um, and those, those are excellent. Um, I prefer personally to fish caddis during the salmon fly hatch. It seems like the fish are a little bit more eager to come up and eat caddis over a, over a big dry fly or one that they've seen quite a few times from, from other anglers in front of us in the boat. But, um, you know, what I, what I've kind of started to like more and more, um, is, is looking for that, you know, after the caddis, you know, you get your yellow sallies that come off, um, and then you also start to see, you know, you get your flavs, um, you get your March Browns early in the season. Um, you've got your, uh, your PMDs. Um, and then a couple of my favorites, uh, just a lot of fun, especially in Yellowstone national park are the gray drakes and the green drakes. Um, seeing a, seeing a cutthroat come up from five feet underneath the water to eat a size 12 dry fly, um, is, is, is pretty incredible. Um, so those, those are some that are really fun. Um, I particularly like the, the PMD hatch on the Beaverhead river. Um, we fished, uh, together on the spring creeks with uh, a little bit more technical, uh, pickier trout. Um, the beaverheads like that, but the trout are not nearly as picky and the, the hatches are just incredible. Um, I've been on the river where you can't even see the water. There's so many yellow sallies and PMDs on the water. It's just, it's, it's unbelievable what we call a carpet hatch. Um, and just, just mind blowing. Um, I've never thought that I would ever see something like that, um, in my life. And I've seen it multiple times on that river. Um, it's just a, it's a bug factory. Um, and, uh, not only the beaverhead is the, the Missouri river as well. Um, I saw one of the most epic trico hatches this July, um, that I've, I've ever seen, um, and talk about small dry flies and picky trout, boy, that's, that's a, that's a fun place to fish as well as the Missouri river, especially during the trico hatch about mid July. Um, that can be a lot of fun, uh, and very challenging. As you can gather, folks, it does sound as though it could well be heaven that we're talking about at the moment. But you were talking about those carpet hatches. And does that mean that's challenging for you and anglers when there's so many bugs on the water and targeting those fish? Is that a difficult process then for you to guide when you're getting a massive hatch like that? Absolutely. Uh, not only from a guide standpoint, just any angler standpoint, no matter how, um, how seasoned you are, um, <laughs> those fish, when they have that many bugs to choose from, it's, uh, it's, it's like being in the right place at the right time. Um, sometimes those fish just, I feel like come up with their eyes closed and just get <laughs> big mouthfuls of, of bugs. Um, and so it makes it very hard if you, if you really want to specifically target fish, um, some of those carpet hatches don't necessarily, um, help you out at all. Um, but it's just when you're in the moment and you get to see that, um, I feel like the, the, the fishing aspect and the catching go out the window and you just, you have to sit there and enjoy the, the amount of bugs that are coming off, um, because you may very well never see that again, um, in your life. And it's just, it really is incredible. Well, it does sound amazing. And you touched on the salmon fly hatch as well, which are a huge, great stone fly. Do you find, and we've talked about the mayfly, I think, on here that we have the Danikas or Green Drake, I guess, as you'd call them. And we have situations where the fish will suddenly just say, I've had enough now and turn on to midges or trichos or whatever that may be. Do you have something similar to that? Do you experience that, that fish almost have enough of a hatch and just switch off it immediately? They just can't take any more of it. A a absolutely. And as a, as a fishing guide, um, now see, you know, seeing that and experiencing some of that of what you just touched on, you know, my, um, my thought process and my game plan typically, um, is to not be in a section of the river where you're seeing the salmon flies. Um, as you, as you may know, the salmon flies move up the river every single day, um, and trying to catch that famed salmon fly hatch. Um, I'll get to areas where my clients often will say, well, there's no bugs up here. And I say, well, that's perfect. We want to get in front of them where the fish haven't, haven't seen them or are not absolutely gorged on them where they're just, they've eaten enough and they're pinned down to the bottom and they're resting. Um, and a lot of times 
when you're right in the middle of all those bugs, it's the hardest time to catch the fish. Um, and they absolutely do get full and they do, they may not stop eating, but they're going to get very selective. Um, and, and so my plan of attack when, when that starts to happen is really try to try to dial in where those bugs are on the river and try to get ahead of them. Um, at least a, a mile or two up the river, um, if not 10 miles up the river, um, to try to get ahead of them, try to put those flies, uh, in front of fish that haven't seen a million natural salmon flies or golden stones come down the river. Um, that's sort of my plan of attack typically during the salmon fly hatch, or just to not throw a salmon fly. Like I touched on, um, throw those smaller caddis, typically a little black caddis, an 18 or a 20. We'll, we'll get them to come up way more so than a, a size four salmon fly. Nice, nice. And what about hoppers then? Do you, are they a bit of a guide's dream that when they come onto the water? Absolutely. You know, we're always looking for hopper season. Um, we may be guilty of, of starting to throw those way earlier uh, than we used to. Um, it, one, it's easy for the clients to see them. Um, I don't know how many times, you know, you get into the blue wing, olive, trico, midge hatch stuff that, you know, the clients just can't see the flies. And uh, when you finally get a chance to throw a hopper down, uh, you don't have to worry about your clients being able to see it at all. Same as the salmon flies and the golden stones. But, uh, you know, hopper season when it's upon us, um, it's God's gift to guides. Um, the clients can throw them in there. They can drag them around. They can do whatever. Their men's don't have to be pretty and fish are keyed in on them. Um, and that's typically, you know, mid July to August, um, even early September, um, you know, on, you know, the major rivers, uh, the Madison, you know, July and August can be great early September, uh, the Missouri, even all the way through September can be excellent. And then, you know, yesterday we, we landed a couple of fish on a hopper, even though it was super cold outside, uh, the weather was starting to turn, the fish are still eating hoppers. Um, so that's always great. A hopper with a size 18 blue wing olive behind it did the trick yesterday. <laughs> nice, nice. And I guess the hopper's going to be one of those flies that can just bring a, a trout up from the depths to come come eat it, can't it? Absolutely. And that's the great thing about uh, about the hopper bite is those clients don't have to put, put the fly in, in, in an exact spot or have a great drift. Um they can kind of throw it out wherever, um, you know, as that, as that water warms up and the river, the river start to drop, especially the Yellowstone, these freestone streams, the Yellowstone, the big hole, when that, when that water starts to drop and you start seeing those edges and those drop-offs really get pronounced by that clean water going into green water, you can literally throw that hopper on the edge or two feet off the edge of that green water. And those fish are going to come up from who knows how deep to eat that. That's amazing. And the drift boat, we're going to come on to guiding and everything else. But obviously, you know, in, in the UK and Europe as a whole, I think somebody in Scandinavia tried a business with drift boats. But that's a great way to see so much and cover so much of the river, isn't it? And for you, is that physically hard work as well on a on a daily basis? You know, as far as, uh, as the amount of work that goes into that, as opposed to, to walkway guiding, um, and hiking, you know, I, I would say it's a toss up. Um, it, it's about the same amount of work. Um, you know, rowing a drift boat looks hard and I guess, uh, I don't speak for everybody that's in a drift boat. Some of these guys that are, that are doing some of the steelhead stuff and, and some of these bigger, bigger rivers, um, really, really, they, they, they earn their money. Uh, they really, really work hard. Uh, but I would say, especially these tailwaters, you know, it's, it's pretty easy day in the drift boat. Um, we certainly still work hard, um, doing row arounds, putting clients in the right spot, especially some of the faster, faster water on the upper river, the big hole and the Yellowstone can, can be challenging, but it's also a lot of fun. Um, you know, you kind of have a little, a little course, you know, you're, 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 um, your, your spots that you're trying to pick, um, and your lines that you're trying to go down in the river, um, the spots that you're trying to get your drift boat in to get your client to cast in that one little pool or that little bit of pocket water that you don't think anybody else has put the effort in to kind of row back and really stop the boat and get your clients to get a fly in there. Um, it can turn into work, but the drift boat is such a good tool, 
um, especially on these uh, freestone streams to cover water um, because you're certainly limited on this bigger water on your walk weight ability and the amount of water that you can cover and how the fish see the fly. Um, I feel like it really affects your presentation when you're in that drift boat and you're floating down with your fly, you get such a better presentation. It's such a longer drift for some of those bigger fish to really key in and, and, and get that fly and, and put it up in front of them far enough where they're keying in on it. When it's coming down, they're going to eat it. No doubt. Um, as opposed to, to having much shorter drifts and trying to find those spots on foot. Um, you know, you're covering easy 12 miles a day, um, and a day of fishing in a drift boat, as opposed to, you know, working really, really hard to cover three or four on foot. Um, so it just, it's, it's a huge advantage. Um, but I wouldn't say that it's, it's a harder or easier day, um, than walk waiting by any means. I, I would say it's about the same. Right, got you. Because I was thinking as well, as a guide, it's nice for you that you can control if your clients aren't so good at casting, you can come closer into the bank. Because to give listeners an idea, what you're doing is throwing towards the bank, putting a, a reach cast or a mend in, and then letting it drift and then lifting off. And it's quite rapid fire fishing but you can control how close to the bank if somebody hasn't got a great cast you can throw there is there much of a difference with you being closer to the bank rather than further away from it how have you noticed that you know five ten feet can make a big difference uh, absolutely and it's all that 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 really is um kind of uh water uh water depth or flow dependent on how close or far away you are from the bank i find you know earlier in the season um as the water levels are high and coming down those fish are a lot closer to the bank um and tucked in and especially like during your salmon fly hatch when when that water is almost at its peak and coming down those fish are right on the bank and you have to be a, a little bit more of a seasoned caster or have a little bit more experience to really get that fly in there. You can still take clients that are, that are novice fishermen and you can get them on fish. Um, but, but when those fish are, are keyed in and they're stuck on those banks, kind of, as I say, you, you really have to, it, it's, it's more angler dependent than it is on the guide. We can get you close, but you've got to you've got to pick that spot, and you've got to be within a foot of the bank. Now, as that water goes down, those fish move towards the kind of kind of tend to move towards the middle of the river, and you you have way way more forgiveness. Um, those clients can kind of throw it anywhere as long as it's in the water. You can kind of row away from the bugs and let them let out line if they have to. If it's really you know if they're really not getting it. Um, as long as you get that bug in the water, just have them peel off some line and just kind of row away from it um, and then let them go. You know, it makes it much more easy uh, later on in the season when those fish aren't necessarily right on the bank um, to guide out of the drift boat. But using that as a tool, it's uh, it, it definitely makes it much easier as far as the client's casting, um, especially later in the season when it's when the fish are more spread out and they're not pinned up on the bank. Yeah. And I guess that's giving the fish a, a pretty fair chance in the sense that you're really only getting one or two shots at them and then you're gone and they may eat Absolutely. and that's it, isn't it? Yeah. 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 You're not, um, or it, it depends on the, it depends on the river that you're fishing too. Um, you know, they all kind of have their, their own strategy as far as rowing your drift boat. Um, you know, some of the tailwaters are, are waters where you may anchor up and fish a hole for a long time and really, you know, work fish over. Um, some, some tail waters you'll do row arounds where you row back up and then drift back down and then row up and drift down. A lot of the, a lot of the freestone streams, you know, you don't necessarily have that luxury in a lot of spots. You get one chance to hit it and that's it. You know, if you, if you don't get the flies in the right spot or, or make a good mend or a reach cast, the fish aren't going to eat it. You're, you're going to drag your fly out of the water and, and you, you might as well just look to the next spot. Um, and, and that's, that's really nice. You know, those fish just don't get, uh, hammered as much. Uh, they don't, they don't get beat up, uh, which is, which is great. Um, it gives them more of an opportunity to be wild, natural trout looking for, looking for real bugs, as opposed to seeing the same kind of nymphs go through the, 
the same runs over and over all day long. Nice, nice. And it is a surreal experience for you know a, a, a nation and a, a part of the world, I guess, Europe that doesn't experience drift boating. All I can say is, if you get the chance, do it because it's rapid fire rapid excitement i remember i think i probably said to you when when we met that the first time i did it my friend ray got me a, a day on the colorado and the guide had been out the night before we hit every rock and it just was a nightmare my my friend was really embarrassed and we were netting trying to net our own fish while this guy was sort of trying to and it sort of put me off a little bit and then thankfully i fished with yourself and then i got it and absolutely loved it. And I know the team that um, I brought down on that trip. I said, to, I remember briefing them beforehand and said, "You're not going to like it the first time. You're going to think it's really weird." And then I could hear one of them called a mile away up the river, screaming with excitement that he had caught a fish. And and it is one of those opportunities and you get to see so much as well don't you you might see wildlife bald eagles moose whatever it may be it's it's not just the river you're seeing so much along the way as well aren't you yeah that's that's what's nice about being in the drift boat is just the fact that you can cover so much water your perspective of of the fish and fishing is totally different because you're doing it from the river as opposed to the bank um you, you know, and a lot of times in those in those drift boats, you, you've got the perspective where you're standing up and looking down um, and, and watching those fish come up um, as opposed to sometimes you're, you know, you're down, you know, trying to be in the grass, being a little bit more stealthy, not necessarily seeing the fish's reaction to your fly when it hits the water. You really get a cool perspective of being in the boat and, and being able to watch the fish along with the the abundance of wildlife that we have out here, um, especially, you know, over in Dillon on the big hole is super common to see moose on the, on the river. Um, it's, it's very common to see elk along the river over here on the Yellowstone. Um, the bald eagles are super abundant. Um, the ospreys, the golden eagles, even, um, you know, it's, it would be a rare occurrence if I didn't see an osprey come down and, and catch a fish in front of us during the course of the day, which, you know, sometimes can be frustrating if the fishing is difficult and they do it right in front of you and make it look easy. But it's also just incredible to see, you know, uh, nature and the life cycles and, and everything like that and, and getting to see, you know, mother nature raw and, and wild. Uh, it's, it's really a, a treat to have out here to be able to cover so many miles, river miles, um, and, and do it in the river instead of on the bank. Nice. Let's talk about species then. You've talked about the cutthroat. You've talked about brown trout. What else do you have in your streams there? So um, the cutthroat, uh, we've got the West Slope and the Yellowstone cutthroat, uh, which we are so lucky to have and very fortunate. Uh, we also have rainbows and brown trout. Um, and then in a few places we get to, uh, we're lucky enough to have Arctic grayling, um, as well as brook trout. Um, we still have a, 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 a couple of places that are really healthy brook trout fisheries, um, some high mountain lakes, as well as some really small, tiny creeks that can be just an absolute blast to, to fish little tiny pocket water, bring in a one weight or even smaller and, and just have a heyday with 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 smaller brook trout and just eager to eat dry flies all day long it can really be a blast um so we've got tons of opportunity um the other fish that often gets overlooked is the mountain white fish uh, which is one of the only native fish uh, around here um, other than the yellowstone cutthroat um, they kind of get dogged on a little bit but they also eat dry flies um so you know some days those can be a blast to catch and a blessing. Uh, when the fishing gets stuff they seem to always eat. So you can't forget the white fish. I'm so pleased you said that because I love them. I've got a real soft spot for them. They're kind of like grayling with a slightly different shape mouth and, of course, without the beautiful dorsal fin as well. But um, they are, um, yeah, I think they're the unsung hero sometimes as well. And that can make a super, super grand slam, hopefully, if you're lucky enough to to catch absolutely. all of those. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so 
a guide stream. Yeah. <laughs> so guiding to you, how long have you been guiding now? And I'm guessing, well, I, I think I know the answer to this because we talked about it when I was over with you, but what brought you to Montana and what brought you into guiding? So when I first started, I actually, um, you know, I, I was living in the Midwest, um, working in a fly shop, going to college, uh, or trying to go to college, uh, fishing a lot more than going to school, um, and uh, working at a local fly shop, uh, and uh, I uh, closing down shop one day. A father son came into the fly shop, um, kind of hit it off with him, asked him, you know, what what they did to, uh, for work, and the son said that he was a fishing guide in Wyoming, and I had never been out west. Uh, the farthest I'd been was, you know, Eastern Colorado, which is pretty close to where I lived. And, uh, I was like, man, that's my dream job. I'm just absolutely obsessed, uh, with the sport of fly fishing. Um, I would love to try to get into that. And he actually said that he went to a fly fishing guide school and my jaw dropped. I couldn't believe that there was actually a school to be a fishing guide. Um, so I instantly went home, researched it. Um, made a few phone calls and that's when I found Hubbard's Yellowstone Lodge. Uh, they were running a fishing guide school and I had talked to a guy out there, Eben Schaefer, and, uh, he was kind of running the, the fly fishing guide school. He had a spot in August, uh, which was a few months away. Um, I took him up on it. I came out, they hired me out of the guide school and I really never looked back. And that was in 2008. Um, so that was, you know, 15 years ago, I came out to Montana and started guiding, kind of, kind of dipped my toes in and really started guiding probably about, you know, totally full time, um, in like 2011, um, full time guiding, um, 2011, um, until about 2015, um, and then started to bounce all over the state, do more than fly fishing, Uh, started to do the upland bird guiding, uh, uh, big game hunting. And then um, six years ago, I got my outfitter's license, uh, which allows me to run my own business, hire my own guides, kind of step outside of just the Yellowstone area, um, which has kind of put me in a position where I've been able to, in the last few years, really bounce around the state, uh, get a really good feel for for waters that aren't as, as fished as hard, um, maybe some waters that aren't as well known, um, and, and give me an opportunity to really give my clients, um, a really good opportunity to fish waters that, that maybe they wouldn't get a chance to fish, or if, you know, they come out year after year, they get a new look at a, a bunch of different water and they can really kind of hone in on, you know, do they really like to walk away small streams? Do they like to fish tailwaters? Do they like to fish, you know, out of the drift boat in a freestone river? Um, are they just dry fly fishermen? Do they like to nymph? Do they, you know, do they want a streamer fish? Um, so it really gives um, the folks that want to come out and fish with me an opportunity to see a lot of the state, travel around, um, and really see a lot of different types of water. Um, and to fish a lot of different ways, you know, you know, I'm not just necessarily a dry fly fisherman or a streamer fisherman. Um, I can really tailor a trip to, to anybody that wants to do anything. Uh, we've got all kinds of different water, technical, uh, spring Creek water to, to wide open tail water where fish are really not as picky. Um, so that's kind of been my evolution and my time spent here in Montana is really, you know, started in 2008. Um, it's now 2023 and I feel like I've just kind of scratched the surface of everything that's out here. But that's the sign of a good guide for me that because it would be very easy if you had repeat customers just say, right, we're going to meet you at Gardner and we're going to float down and we're going to come and they do the same thing. And that to me is testament of a good guide that you want to mix things up. And that's good for you as well, because let's put this in context for for listeners you know and the guiding business in the uk certainly has grown and probably continues to grow but the amount of days people are doing how many days are you doing guiding uh, a year 
Uh, so, so fishing, uh, you know, typically, uh, I'm, I'm right around, uh, 90 to 120 fishing days a year. Um, and, and that's, that, that's, those are the days that I have on the water, um, with clients. And, and then I also roll over into my hunting stuff, uh, which is, is, is close to another hundred days between, uh, waterfowl, upland bird and big game hunting, um, so I'm with sports and or clients for, for, for close to 200 days or, or more every year, um, sometimes 250 days a year. Um, and that definitely, um, you know, if I was, if I was guiding the same stretch of river every single day for 120 days, it'd be pretty easy to get burnt out. Um, you know, that client that wants to come out on that 115th day might not get the best, uh, get the best guide service. I might be a little, little burnt and, blindfold me and put me in a boat and send me down the river with the guys. Um, so that's what makes it nice for me as well. Um, you know, being able to bounce around and fish different water keeps it, keeps it new, keeps it fresh for me. Um, and I feel like the clients get, um, a lot more of my attention than, you know, me being bored with the same stretch of water that I fished all season. Yeah. Yeah. That makes perfect sense. And that must be good for repeat business. And does that mean then a lot of your business will be folks from the U S or do you get many people from overseas? Yeah, absolutely. We get, we get folks from all over the country. We had a few folks from France this year uh, that came out they floated the Yellowstone river and also fished in Yellowstone park with us. Um, we get folks like yourself, the UK, um, we even get uh, a fair amount of folks, uh, um, extremely good fishermen from Japan. Um, and, and that's, that's always a treat. Um, the language barrier sometimes is, uh, is a little bit difficult. Um, but at the same time, you know, everybody can speak fish. Everybody can, can pick a bug and point to a spot. And, uh, especially the, the seasoned fly fishermen, um, when they see a rising trout, you know, everybody seems to know what to do. Um, and it's also nice to, to have folks that, that maybe don't understand exactly what we're saying and have a different approach. Um, and that's a great learning experience for a guide um, to sit back and watch um, how somebody else approaches a fish and, and watches a fish or maybe not watches a fish and goes right in after it. Um, just the different techniques and approaches. You know, a lot of times that can be really helpful for us in the future. Like, oh, you know, did you see what he did? You see how he watched that fish and what he did there? OK, you know, I'm going to add that to my bag of tricks and use that later on. Um, so it really, you know, diversifies our uh our guiding tackle box, if you will, on, uh, on ways to fish and, uh, different techniques. Um, and, and, and it's, it's really, really fun when we, when we get folks, um, from out of the country, um, it really makes it new. It makes it interesting. Um, but I would say the ma majority of our, our fishing clientele, uh, are from the U S yeah. Yeah. I'm fascinated to know you mentioned the Japanese. And I think when we were fishing, I, I asked you because, and I think you said Scandinavian anglers were very good, which I've always felt exactly the same as well, and Spanish and lots of people from around Europe. But you mentioned the Japanese. And what made them such adept anglers, in your, your opinion? Um, it, you, you know, the few, the few, uh, Japanese anglers that I've had are very in tune with, um, you know, a lot of the Takara stuff, um, the, the inline nymphing, um, and, and to set them, uh, watch them and, 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 and them, the, the setup that they have, uh, their, their technical ability, um, to fish very small flies, um, very well um, is, is, is pretty impressive. Um, setting and watching up to, I took, uh, kind of did a similar, similar trip, uh, with a Japanese client where we went and fished the gardener, um, with a Tinkara rod and, uh, um, but with dry flies instead of, uh, you know, you know, nymphing, it was, uh, such a cool experience to watch them, uh, just so technical. Um, and, and and in an area where I would, I would not typically dry fly fish at all. Um, some of the smaller flies that they were using and the, the way that they landed the trout was, was really impressive. Um, cause, cause there's some big fish in the garter and I, you know, the Takara stuff is I'm like, oh, that's, you know, more for some smaller trout, maybe a brook trout would be great. Um, you know, and you see them land a 16 inch brown trout, 
on a Tinkara rod and you're just like, how did you do that? Um, <laughs> You know, so, so watching that, um, and, uh, and watching, watching how they approach it and how they're, you know, they almost approach it on the fact that, okay, how am I going to land this fish before I start fishing to it? Um, with the Tinkara style fishing, you know, that was, that was kind of a cool experience that I had. Nice. I do like the sound of that. Tell me about the culture then for listeners of fishing in Montana. How how deeply entrenched is it locally and nationally? And if somebody from UK was visiting and walked into a fly shop or whatever it may be, how what would they see? And would they see drift boats parked out the front? How how would it be? Well, uh, at least here in Livingston and a lot of other these uh, small fishing communities, uh, um, you, you can't throw a rock and not hit a guide or a drift boat. Uh, <laughs> so there's a lot of us around. Uh, we're pretty much all wearing plaid shirts and have beards. Uh, there's some messes around our necks. Um, but, uh, you know, the culture here is, uh, especially in Livingston, it's very laid back. Um, most of the guides communicate with each other at the local watering hole at the end of the day. Um, getting a beer or a cocktail. Um, and, and everybody's really nice. Everybody's open. Everybody's sharing information for the most part. Um, you know, and that's, that's kind of the cool thing. You know, one of the things that I look forward to at the end of the day is, is getting back, going to the local pub and hanging out with all the other fishing guides. Um, you know, the Yellowstone in particular is 640 miles of undammed river. We have 150 miles of it in our backyard, you know, so, you know, Hey, where did you go today? Oh, you went down there and fished. How was it down there? Oh, up here was, you know, and you get a totally different gauge of how the fishing was, um, depending on where the guides fish and what stretch of river, you know, you could have an, Hey, the, you know, the streamer bite was unbelievable, you know, here on this stretch of river today. And you're like, Oh man, I couldn't get them to touch a streamer, but you know, they were eating gray drakes like crazy. Um, it can be totally, totally different every day. Um, and that's what makes it fun. Um, you know, it was kind of funny the other day I was, I was in the, the Murray bar is kind of a famous, uh, guide bar here in Livingston and, and they have what they call bar flies uh, up on the wall and they're pictures of fishing guides, um, with their favorite fly underneath them. And they're called bar flies, which is, is pretty funny. We also hang out in the bar quite a bit, but, um, <laughs> You know, you would you would think uh, there were some drug deals going down at the bar because uh, there's a couple older fellows that, that don't necessarily guide anymore, but they still tie flies and they've got their little paper bags. And, <laughs> you know, you see them from across the bar handing somebody and then you see the guide giving them cash. And, you know, you, you kind of wonder, you know, they're you know, like, I wonder what he just bought. Did he buy some of LJ's ants or, you know, did he get some, uh, you know, Doug McKnight's hoppers or, you know, what are you, what are you buying? What, you know, what's in the bag? Uh, you kind of want to want to get an inside peek of, you know, what was working. Cause obviously they're buying flies that were working for him. Um, so it's pretty funny um, around here, you know, what goes on at the bar, uh, what gets said, you know, and it's also a time for, for the client, uh, for the guides to kind of blow off some steam and talk about the clients. So you can, only imagine what gets said uh, <laughs> on some of the days, uh, especially when guys, you know, the fishing's good and they didn't quite have, uh, you know, seasoned anglers in the boat. <laughs> yeah, I feel that. I do feel that, I have to say. Um, and one of the questions I was going to ask you was about the friendliness of guides friendly to each other. And you very diplomatically said nearly everyone is, um, which is wonderful to hear. Do you think that's because there's enough clients and there's enough fishing to go around. So there's no need to get territorial over anything. Absolutely. Uh, there's, there's more fishing clients than anybody could handle. Um, it's pretty, pretty low pressure on catching fish. Um, everybody seems to be pretty successful. Um, so it's not like there's a hundred people fighting over five fish. Uh, you know, the fish per mile counts have been, you know, kind of through the roof on the majority of the rivers out here and have everything seemed to be very, very healthy. Um, you know, so the guides, you know, there's, there's not really any secrets at this point. Um, you know, and, and there are a few trade secrets and, and some of, some of the guides will hold stuff underneath their hat, which is great. Um, I, I believe that every guide should have, have something 
a little bit different, you know, underneath his cap that he doesn't necessarily share with everybody. Um, but for the most part, you know, you roll into town somewhere new, um, you know, go to the local fly shop, ask them what's going on. They're not going to give you the runaround. They're going to tell you what's going on. Um, the guides at the boat ramp are, are usually really friendly as not, as long as you're not doing anything, you know, totally off, off color. Um, you know, everybody's really friendly. You ask questions, you're going to get the right answers. There's not a whole lot of people that are going to run you around. Um, and that, that is a, a testament to, to how many fish are around here and how many people want to come out and fish. Um, very rarely do you have, uh, you know, instances where, you know, somebody's being a jackass. Um, you know, some days are, you know, you get a guy that's not necessarily having a good day and they may, they may be a little bit more snippy, um, uh, a little bit rank, but for the most part, everybody, everybody's out here to do the same thing, which is to have fun and catch fish. Um, at the end of the day, that's our job. Um, put everybody on fish, have a good time. Um, and to get the clients to leave with a, you know, with a positive attitude, if they go somewhere and they see that, you know, a bunch of guides are assholes. They're not necessarily want to go back to that river. Um, even if the fishing was great. Um, so we all, we all kind of have that. I feel like the same mentality, like treat everybody good. Uh, you know, all the clients are everybody's clients, you know, at the end of the day, uh, they're spending money in the fly shops. Uh, they're spending money on fishing licenses, uh, which in turn leads to conservation and money and money in the pocket for Montana FWP, uh, to maintain a lot of the fisheries that we have. So at the end of the day, 99% of the people are, are super, super nice. Um, everybody likes to share information. Um, there's not too many secrets anymore. So it, it makes it for a really uh, pleasurable experience all around the board, um, all over the places that I've, that I've bounced around to. It seems like everybody's more than willing to, to help out and kind of show you around. That's lovely to hear. And we've talked about so many of these streams and it'd be remiss of me um, not to bring up Spring Creeks with you. And, you know, we have chalk streams here and I guess they're as close uh, to your equivalent of them would you be able to describe them a little bit for listeners and the experience of fishing as spring creek yeah so that's uh you know that's one of my most favorite uh kind of days that i get is if i get a client that wants to fish the spring creek um basically what our spring creeks are uh they're gin clear water uh the water is, is more or less a consistent temperature year round, um, in the fifties, it's, you know, fairly cold water, um, very little fluctuation. Typically in the spring creeks, you get some really, really good hatches, very consistent hatches throughout the year. Um, and one thing is that, you know, most of these spring creeks out here are private. And, uh, so what that means is that, um, you know, the owners of these spring creeks, these private lands have booking uh, availability. Um, so you'll call and book, book a, a rod. Um, you're not, you're not booking a beat on a river, um, but you're booking a rod, uh, which is nice. You're not limited to one section of a spring creek. You get to kind of fish this, the entire spring creek, uh, once you book it, which is nice. Um, but with that being said, the fish are very educated. Um, and with that crystal clear water, um, you really have your hands full with, with fooling the trout, um, which, you know, makes it a lot of fun. Um, sometimes it can make it extremely challenging when the fish are eating everything except for your fly. Uh, but you're using, you know, fairly small tippet, you know, six X sometimes go down to seven. Um, a lot of times you can fool them with five X if you get the right drift, um, and, uh, it just, it just makes for a very educational, um, experience. Uh, what I tell a lot of my clients that, that want to come and fish the spring creeks with me, especially if they haven't, or if they're on the fence about it is I tell them it's, it's probably the best way to learn how trout act and how, how they, how they move and where they eat and where they sit and, and, and being able to watch, you know, from start to finish a fish, setting down and almost sulking on the bottom, resting to getting turned on when the bugs start to come up, you know, when those nymphs are going, you know, from the nymph stage to, you know, to, to hatching and rising, um, you know, 
you get to see the life cycle, not only of the bug, but to, to watch that fish go from eating nymphs to eating emergers to eating the dry fly and then back to the spinner. Um, and, and, and being able to watch that almost in an aquarium um, type setting. Um, and most of the, most of the spring creeks, the fish are spooky, but they're not, they're not going to move and not come back. Most of those fish have their feeding lanes and areas where they pretty much live. Um, they're not going to go too far away from where you see them. Um, they are spooky, but not in a sense where you have to be super, super stealthy, um, on a lot of the spring creeks, you know, some of them are, are more spooky than others. Um, but it's a really, really fun, really educational experience, um, a very humbling experience for some anglers that really think that they're dialed in. Um, and it can just, uh, it, it can be, you know, one of the most gratifying, um, fly fishing experiences that you can have to set, um, you know, it, it more of a traditional dry fly experience where you're setting and watching a fish. You're not just fishing to fish or throwing your fly in, hoping a fish is going to come up. You're, you're finding a fish on the river, you're watching it eat, you're figuring out what it eats, and then you're casting to it. Um, you know, and, and, and to me, that's, that's kind of the full circle of what we're doing as a fly fisherman, you know, it, it, it's great to go out and learn how to cast and to fish and catch fish. Um, uh, but when you can find a fish, pick out what it's eating, identify what it's eating, tie it on and, and put that fly over that fish and have it eat. I feel like if you do that once in your life, that's, that's all you need. Um, and to be able to go back and do it again and again is, is even better. Um, but, but just that whole experience and that whole full circle of, of fishing, um, and education at the same time really is, is, is some of the greatest memories that I have ever fishing have, have been on the spring creeks. Um, you know, and a lot of them have small little warming huts that you can fish in the winter time. Of course they don't freeze. So, you know, that's a fishery that we have all year long. Um, and it can be just, just awesome. And there's, you know, in the winter time, there's not a whole lot of people fishing out here when it's zero degrees. So, uh, you can find yourself, you know, the only one on the entire river, uh, in the winter time with some pretty good Mitch hatches too. So, um, it can be a lot of fun. Nice. That sounds absolutely fabulous. I guess you've had some of your most memorable days guiding people and some of the trickiest days guiding people as well in those situations as well, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Some, I mean, honestly, some of the, some of the best memories that I have are probably the most frustrating times that I've had on the, on, on the spring creeks. Um, and, and frustrating also correlates to some days where I've learned the most about not only myself, my client and also the fish. Um, you know, some days I just get to the bottom of my box and I've thrown everything, you know, and I finally tie something on that, you know, doesn't necessarily look like anything that they should eat. Um, and then I have a new spring Creek fly, um, you know, put that, put that a little bit higher in the box there and not maybe a last pick. Um, but yeah, you know, and that's, and that's the great thing about the sport of fly fishing to me is the ability um, and the opportunity that I get every day out on the water, um, either in the drift boat um, or with my wading boots on uh, is to learn uh, and, and to, to get an education from these trout that we're fishing to. Um, you know, that's the name of the game for me is as long as I can learn something just about every day that I'm on the water, I, I, I've met my goal and, and I'm a better guide. Um, and, and fly fishing really gives you the opportunity to learn something new, no matter how long you've done it, um, every single time that you're out on the water. That's beautifully put. And I know that's completely BS free as well, because I know how you feel about it and what it means to you. And I know you're going to be in guiding for a long, long time to come. And I hope you go continue to go from success to success. Um, You've given us what I wanted from this is that our season's winding down. I wanted people to just get a look inside what Montana is like. They may never visit, but you've painted it so beautifully with such passion, with such love for the trout, the people, the rivers, and everything that goes along with that as well. So it feels as though you do live in a place that is pretty special. But as you as a fly angler then, and I started this by 
saying that, you know, Montana is a place that many people dream of going to. Where is the place that you dream to go cast a fly at? Oh, that's, <laughs> that's two places. You can have two places. There you uh, go. Uh, anywhere, first of all, that I could fly fish would be a destination that I would want to go to. Um, that's a that's a really tough question. Anywhere that I could go, you know, I've uh, I've never been to New Zealand, um, and I know that's a that's a top place um, on a lot of people's list, um, and, and one that I dream of going. Um, you know, New Zealand would be pretty high up there, um, on my list. Um, you know, and uh, another, another, maybe a little bit more, um, um, obscure place. Uh, I would love to go to Slovakia, um, and, and do some, some fly fishing. Um, the marble trout, um, would be, would be one thing that I would like to do. Um, it'd be a little bit different. Um, not necessarily looking for giant fish, but just something different. The, the, the rivers there are just beautiful. Um, and, and something different, um, you know, than, than here where I'm at. Um, and, and, and so a, a change of, a change of pace, a change of scenery would be, would be quite nice. But, uh, I would say my number one, um, place that I, that I haven't been that I'd really like to go is New Zealand. Um, those fish are right up my alley. Um, I think, uh, I'm a glutton for punishment on picky <laughs> trout, and I think that'd be perfect. That's a very, very fine choice. Vern, it's been wonderful to talk with you, to catch up with you. We've spoken for over an hour. Um, listeners, uh, Eric takes the most beautiful photographs as well. Um, you need to have a look at his social media. What are your social media handles? How can people find you? Or if they decide they want to go to Montana, I can't. As I always say on here, he's not paid to come on here. He's not asked to come on here. I just wanted to give listeners the chance to hear a little bit about Montana from the inside. But if people decide that they're heading out that way, how do they find you? Um, well, I've got an Instagram page uh, that I run, um, and it's greater underscore Yellowstone underscore Outfitters. Um, you can find me on Instagram that way. You can also find me on uh, Facebook. Uh, it's just Greater Yellowstone Outfitters. Um, and then if you'd like to visit my website, I've got tons and tons of information on lots of different, lots of different water uh, on my website. And that's greateryellowstoneoutfitters.com. Um, please uh, feel free. And, and I tell anybody, uh, if anybody has any questions, uh, whether or not they plan on being guided or non-guided, uh, please feel free to call me and ask me any questions. Um, even rivers uh, that I don't necessarily outfit. Um, the guide community out here is fairly tight knit and fairly small. Um, I can easily, easily get you guys connected uh, with other reputable guides and outfitters out here, even if it's even if it's somewhere that I don't outfit. And I'm happy to do that. Happy to take the time with anybody to uh, to kind of help tailor the trip. Uh, and to make it what what they dream of being, you know, if people have an idea of what what they want uh, when they come to Montana, you know, I try to I try to do my best to to make that happen. That's wonderful to hear. Well, I wish you every success with the hunting season that's looming large on you now. And it's been absolutely, I know we've stayed in touch over the years and it's been lovely to catch up with you. Your passion burns as brightly and as strong as it ever has. Your love for fly fishing continues and long may that continue as well. It's good for fly fishing that we have people like you in it. Um, thank you so much for talking with me today. It's been wonderful to catch up, my friend. Absolutely. Thank you very much for having me. This has been a pleasure to catch up and I uh, wish you the best on uh, your, your falling season and uh, your upcoming season. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. Fantastic. Everyone, this has been the Fly Culture Podcast. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. As I said, I just wanted you to get a sense of what life is like in one of those dream destinations. And I think Eric has told us so much about it that it's getting me excited about the place yet again. But thank you so much for listening to the Fly Culture Podcast. There'll be plenty more of these coming down the line soon. Thanks for listening. The Fly Culture Podcast is brought to you in association with Fly Culture, a quarterly print magazine. For more information, please visit flyculturemag.com. 
You can also find Fly Culture on Instagram, Facebook and Twitter.